you know, I think there should be millionaire creative teams. If you make that a precondition of anything you try, that there's pre-existing evidence for its likely success, then you're not really going to innovate significantly. How status symbols and status signaling is evolving, especially in the digital age. One of the strangest things, actually, is the extent to which marketing and business and decision-making in general um, has shied away from psychology. This seems to me fundamentally flawed. You know, you know all my hot buttons, I have to say. <laughs> it's an area of obsession. You'll still save money if you're only travelling into London three days a week. I said, that's not my fucking point, mate. I said, look, I've actually made a photocopy for like two years, you know? It's weird. I mean, <laughs> okay. I mean, okay, if Goldman Sachs said, okay, uh, yes, you can join our graduate program, but it costs you $250,000 to actually be considered as a Goldman Sachs graduate recruit, people would say that's absolutely abominable, right? That's just total profiteering. But if you outsource that function to Yale, Harvard, and MIT, that's okay, apparently. I also listen to a lot of um, true life crime. Today I have with me Rory Sutherland. He is the vice chairman of Ogilvy, one of the largest and most popular marketing and communications agency. He's also the co-founder of their behavioral science practice. He's written a couple of books, Alchemy, The Surprising Power of Ideas That Don't Make Sense. He's also written Transport for Humans more recently. And also he has a range of videos online talking about his perspective in marketing, including TED and TEDx videos. Um, he's also written, um, he's also given a series of audio books, um, Hacking the Unconscious. And Rory's perspective on marketing is a very unique one. Um, today, marketers talk a lot about data, analytics, what we today know as performance marketing, whereas Rory takes um, a very different um, a stance um, in terms of how he approaches marketing and even economics in general. Um, he challenges general economic theory um, in favor of more Austrian economics. And uh, um, he has his whole perspective on behavioral science and how we as humans actually make choices. So with that said, thank you, Rory, for being here. Been following you for about five years now, and it's great to do this with you finally. Well, it's a huge pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. OK, so let's start with a, an overview of what behavioral science is how you got into it, and tell us a bit about how you started this practice within Ogilvy. Gosh, that's a long question. So uh, behavioral science and behavioral economics are both really um, uh, rebrandings of psychology. Um, and in some ways, psychology had a branding problem. Um, I think it was Richard Thaler who made the point that it's perfectly acceptable for the President of the United States to have a Council of Economic Advisors, but it would sound a bit weird if the President of the United States had a Council of Psychological Advisors. You know, the immediate implication of that would be that, the, you know, the, um, uh, the, the President had some sort of mental problems of his own. And, you know, there are conflations with psychiatry, the association of psychology necessarily with the treatment of mental illness, um, so on and so forth. And one of the strangest things, actually, is the extent to which marketing and business and decision making in general um, has shied away from psychology. And You'd expect, I mean, for example, I had a friend who worked in advertising and he got a first in psychology from Oxford. And when he arrived in his first job, fresh from Oxford in an ad agency, he kind of expected people to be kind of beating down his door to ask what the latest thinking in decision science or psychology was about a particular question. And he said, I was there for eight years. Nobody asked me a single question about my time studying psychology at Oxford. They didn't seem to want to know. Now, all I'm saying is that um, I think um, I think what happened is that, first of all, economics started taking psychology seriously by giving, for example, Daniel Kahneman uh, and then later Richard Thaler and several other behavioral scientists uh, Nobel Prizes. Earlier, they had given a Nobel Prize to a brilliant man called Herbert Simon, um, but of, of, of extraordinary polymath. But his work in decision theory didn't really have much traction, even though it was extraordinarily advanced and uh, important. And so the, the general point I'm making is that surely if you're involved in marketing or in any other decision or field, 
where human behavior um, uh, and, or indeed human emotion plays any significant role, you would think you would want to study this and factor it into your decision making. But for the most part, even in marketing, it doesn't happen very much. I mean, I've worked in, um, uh, uh, for example, you know, I've worked in advertising for 30 years. I've never seen a copy of a journal of consumer psychology kicking around on a desk. And this seems to me fundamentally flawed, not necessarily because um, psychology is always right or that it's exact science or that it will tell us exactly what to do under all circumstances, because that's simply an overclaim. That's not going to happen. But at the same time, in a job like ours, um, anything that can give you a new way of looking at the world or a new way of considering a problem uh, or a new way of framing a problem has to be valuable because it increases your kind of creative solution space. And so when, and so, but anyway, that, that's, that's my generalized description. As for my personal description, quite simple. Uh, when I first came into the industry, um, I worked in a place called Ogilvy and Mather Direct, which was a direct marketing agency. Very, very lucky place to work because there were a lot of very, very brilliant people there. And because direct marketing, this would be at the time, bear in mind, which was 1988, uh, there's no internet to speak of. And the internet did exist, but nobody knew what it was. And there was no web. Um, uh, that was basically off the page sales advertisements. Uh, it was direct mail and it was the telephone. Little bit of fax marketing. That was about it. But very, very rapidly in um, working in direct response marketing, uh, you noticed very, very quickly uh, that the results of various creative tests were extraordinarily surprising. You know, that in other words, even in very, very large randomized control trials, which are what, you know, uh, we then called A-B tests, you would get factors or variables which would have an enormous effect on consumer behavior, which seemed to be completely orthogonal to what you might call questions of economic rationality. So, for example, I'll give you a couple of examples. If you sold an American Express card, okay, um, uh, which was perfect for British Airways frequent flyers because uh, they collected air miles on every pound they spent on the card, okay? If you wrote to those people with a British Airways logo and said, you're already a member of the British Airways loyalty program with this American Express card, uh, you can... Um, uh, collect extra miles with every pound you spend, okay? Uh, and it, that came in a British Airways envelope. You got seven times the response that if you wrote absolutely identical words, but put in an American Express envelope. Now, bear in mind, these people didn't have a relationship with American Express, but they did have a relationship with British Airways. So you literally got um, things where something that was basically irrelevant, the information contained within the letter was basically identical. But the question of whether it was someone with, the, with whom they had an existing relationship recommending a brand partnership versus the other way around, someone coming in cold and proposing it um, would, ha would have order of magnitude effects. The same went for extraordinary things. One of the most interesting things is if you allowed people, it was a wonderful test, which is whether you allowed people to respond to the request by phone, by post, or by their choice of phone or post. Okay. And the response rates were respectively, I think, two, five, and 7%. Now, what that meant is if you gave people a choice of phone response or postal response, the response rate was pretty much the aggregate of the other two which was almost suggesting that the biggest determinant of whether people bought the product wasn't what the product was or how much it cost. It was whether you made them make a phone call, whether you made them write a letter or just post a letter, or whether you gave them a choice. Um, and these things, you know, these things were repeatedly really fascinating and really strange and really weird. We knew about things like scarcity bias, by the way, and we knew about things like um, uh, 
uh, uh, hyperbolic discounting in the sense that we didn't call them that. But every single time you wrote to someone with an offer, you always said, please reply within 10 days. Now, to be honest, if you'd replied 40 days later, they still would have delivered the product. But you asked people to reply within 10 or 14 days because you knew that if you didn't actually put some sort of uh, if you didn't impute some sort of time limit on what you were saying, people never bothered to do anything at all. So again, quite a lot of this stuff was kind of counterintuitive and it fascinated me. And so I kept saying, look, there has to be, as, as well as having great creative people and as well as having, you know, media and targeting, there has to be a kind of discipline that studies this stuff. And I used to call it, you know, the thing for which we have no name. And of course, back then there was no internet. So I couldn't go online and discover there were people called Tversky and Kahneman and, uh, you know, so on. And so we more or less sat in complete ignorance of the existence of behavioral science, as did the rest of the world, in fairness, um, until a period, I suppose, in the uh, in the 2000s. And so I, I was a behavioral scientist, if you like, av avant la lettre, not a proper scientist, but I was obsessed with the idea that someone had to study human judgment and decision making in much more depth. And someone, in many ways, you know, working in direct marketing was, as I describe it, the Galapagos Islands for understanding the quirks of human behavior. Because it is, if you like, a very, very well-funded, robust series of social science experiments, albeit intended to sell something, but nonetheless, it's some very, very interesting experiments. And so, when I, what was interesting is when I was, um, uh, when I was actually working in direct marketing, I thought a bit like a, you know, like a Shlomo Benazzi or a Richard Taylor. You know, is there a way in which we could change this? So, you know, uh, change the way we frame this so as massively to increase the um, the likely take up, for instance. And were you still a copywriter or a creative director? Yeah, yeah, yes, but, but being a copywriter was actually okay. probably the best place uh, to, to, to do this. And so eventually, um, I'm reading a series of economics books, and I was very beguiled by economics. So I thought what an incredibly elegant and all encompassing theory, but it didn't really chime with what I'd observed of everyday human behavior working in direct marketing and eventually i discovered on a blog called marginal revolution that richard thaler was bringing out a book called nudge and i read the kind of summary of the book and this seemed to be exactly the, the field of study which i'd been kind of evangelizing um for the previous 10 years and it happened to coincide with me becoming president of the IPA, the Institute of Practitioners in Advertising in, in the UK. And so I made the study of this field and the uh, adoption of this field, the sort of central plank of my presidency um, at the Institute of Practitioners in Advertising, uh, partly on the argument that I said advertising agencies need to know this stuff because it will make them better. But also if our clients learn this stuff and we don't, we'll end up looking very stupid. So it was partly defensive, partly offensive. And then when I when, when that presidency ended two years later in 2011, uh, that's when I kind of founded the behavioral science practice. Uh, I think it's um, it, it's it's simply, you know, it, it's an area of inquiry and it's of huge value, I think, to creative people, because two things. One, it asks bigger questions. And actually, if you if you ask a completely new question or if you reframe the question about half the time, you've solved the problem. You know, a, a, you know, an awful lot of problems persist because we're just asking the question in the wrong way. And behavioral science provides you with an opportunity to reframe, rework the question. The second thing it can do for creative people, as well as providing them with much more interesting definitions of the problem, is actually defending some of the apparent quirks and foibles of creative people. You know, if you look at how creative people take on a problem, to someone versed in conventional economics, some aspects of this are irrational. You know, as I always joke, David Ogilvy at 60 miles an hour, the loudest sound in the new Rolls Royce is the ticking of the clock. Now, the engineers at Rolls Royce were furious about that because it pointed out the noisy clock, but also they wanted to talk about the drivetrain or the suspension because that's where they spend all their money. You see, and 
So the fact that creative people quite often seem to hone in on slightly um, tangential or seemingly irrelevant factors um, can often, or the fact that they take a very odd approach to communication can often be defended actually by the learnings from behavioral science, which is good, really good creative people, you know, and, and no, no person better embodies this than say Dave Trott in the UK, really good creative people are instinctive behavioral scientists. Na they're natural behavioral scientists. Are there any recent examples of sort of counterintuitive things that you see brands doing? And um, are there any brands that you're following closely lately? And um, any any interesting insights or examples of counterintuitive things happening in the digital realm today? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting question. I mean, actually, the first thing to say is that most of the big successes in digital business uh, can only really be explained by behavioral science. I think, why was it Google rather than... Now, you could argue a little bit of this is a little bit of a post-rationalization, and some of it, of course, is, but a lot of life is post-rationalization. Let's, let's not, you know, pretend otherwise. Um, but, you know, why it was Google rather than Ask Jeeves, why it was Facebook rather than MySpace, you know, why Dyson succeeded, why Red Bull succeeded, why Uber succeeded. I think those questions are largely answered behaviorally, actually. Um, now, you know, some of it's individual decision psychology, some of it's social psychology. And similarly, I think quite a lot of um, human failures in action or quite a lot of business failures can be explained, particularly kind of category failures, can be explained, I think, best through behavioral science. I keep saying it's a very British example, which might not mean much to people in Singapore, but you won't really sell solar panels to people in Britain until John Lewis sells them or Marks and Spencer sells them. You know, at the moment, if you want to buy, I mean, you know, one of the most interesting things to show the power of brand familiarity is that, you know, you consider the billions in free publicity that Elon Musk gets. Elon Musk belongs to Tesla to some extent belongs to the same reality distortion field as Apple and has acolytes who post, you know, Elon's every fart uh, on YouTube. OK, but uh, and, and, you know, rather like Apple, it's also considered for some weird reason, perfectly justifiable for news outlets to treat an Apple product launch as a news story in a way they never treat an Android product launch as a news story. You know, that's how it's kind of escaped the normal pull of gravity. But the, you know, the extraordinary success of, you know, the new Ford electric vehicles is, I think, really, really interesting in the sense that, um, uh, you know, it shows that people can only cope with so much familiar, uh, so much unfamiliarity. And what I always found strange about the whole solar power industry was that if you actually want to install solar panels on your house, the first thing you've got to do is ring three companies you've never heard of. And people don't like doing that. You know, it's very simple, you know, quite a lot of human decision making is heuristic. And who are these guys? Are they reputable? Have I heard of them before? Are three very big heuristics we use? If we're going to take a big decision in our life, which might involve investing £10,000, we're going to want to give that £10,000 to somebody we know. Whether we know them literally or we know them through, um, uh, you know, through brand advertising or general fame, that's not really the point. That the heuristic is still there. But I, so I think I, all I'm saying, no, I, no, I don't... I, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful, OK? And I don't really claim that my view on the world is the only valid take. Um, because all human kind of uh, perception, um, phenomenology, is flawed and distorted. Uh, mine, you know, no, no less than anybody else's. What I do argue is that the way I look at these questions is highly complementary, and in some cases may provide solutions very rapidly, where the conventional view of the world will leave you stuck. You talk a lot about, um, so the thing with counterintuitive ideas is there is typically no data at first to support it, 
right? Uh, that's, so when... that, no, uh, that's actually, the, the guy to read on this is very, very good, is uh, Roger L. Martin, a very good uh, business writer, Canadian business writer. He was the dean of the Rotman School for many years and turned it into a spectacular success. So he's actually got form as a very successful um, entrepreneur and businessman as well as being a writer. And he makes this point that this idea, which is really driven, I think, by fear, not by enterprise, that we'll be able to have theory-free, data-driven decision-making, and the data will tell us what to do, is wrong on two counts. First of all, all big data comes from the same place, the past. So all data is unrepresentative of the future by dint of coming from the past. And we're weirdly blind to that fact, but it's a major, major bias because our past five years ago was one of many possible futures. OK, but the second thing is you can't um, in order to do anything significantly new, you need an act not of deduction or induction, but what's called abductive inference. Um, uh, you, you need in some ways an imaginative leap, a hypothesis to ask the question, as Martin puts it, not the question what is, but what would have to be true for this to happen. And that, to some extent, is an act of creative speculation. And it has to be. And you can't innovate without that. Therefore, the people who are looking for evidence of an innovation of success in past data are basically, almost certainly, if you make that a precondition of anything you try, that there's pre-existing evidence for its likely success, then you're not really going to innovate significantly. It's going to be a major constraint. And I think I think we made the mistake because the word creative tends to be used as kind of I describe it as the heated steering wheel of the marketing world. You know, it's nice to have. It's cute, but it's an optional extra. And the point I'm making is if you're actually in marketing and you're dealing with the future. Then some act of speculation, if you like, what would have to be true for this to happen or what if we did this? you will never have full data for, for a hypothetical. And you often, by the way, you often don't end up with a counterfactual either. So the idea that, you know, the idea that simply using pre... The other thing is that it's highly likely that your competitors have data that's pretty similar to your own. So one other problem of this idea of kind of theory-free, imagination-free decision-making is it'll cause businesses to end up in the same place. And the other, the other point is, when you look at the data, statistics are not truths, right? Statistics are like the bastard love child of a random selection of facts and a point of view. OK, and we treat statistical findings as if they're facts. And we also treat causation, sorry, we treat correlation as if it's causation. OK, and so we'll say things like, if you drop the price, sales go up. Therefore, dropping the price will raise sales. Um, <clears throat> actually, that isn't necessarily true. Or it may be that the correlation is caused by something completely different. OK, so I was talking about this actually at Nudstock last Friday. If you have a sale, an economist would look at a high street sale on a high street shop and go, nothing to see here, lower prices, more people buying. But actually, if you simply drop the prices in a shop and didn't create any razzmatazz around it, you just drop the prices, I don't think you'd see a very uh, exciting increase in sales at all. OK, the sale is a com combination of genuinely lower prices combined with scarcity, which is it only lasts a couple of weeks, combined with social proof, which is there are lots of people queuing outside the shop desperate to get in. So that encourages other people to join them. OK, uh, combined with the idea that, by the way, the products are going to run out because generally implicit in the word sale is that these pr these products and these deals won't be available ever again. So what's going on psychologically when consumers flock to a sale? If you just talk to an economist, they'd say it's all about the price. Now, if you talk to a good marketer, they'd say it's as much about the razzmatazz and the uh, and the hoopla 
and the you know the queues outside the door and the you know and, and the special bags that say sale on it and the big things in the window that say close it you know uh, last four days or sale opens or whatever it is and actually i don't think by the way as a result of this i don't think we've done nearly enough experimentation with online sales how do you create with an online sale the kind of razzmatazz that you get with a physical sale where people feel that other people well you know there are a few places tk max will do the you know uh 47 you're the 47th person to look at this today there's a little bit of it going on but i don't i don't think we're even halfway there by the way in terms of what we've experimented with in how you discount and offload inventory in a sale online because i think you know the standard economic explanation is adequate and therefore treated as sufficient and I think I think we're in danger always. And I think we, we're in love of what, what I call the law of one reason, where every outcome has a single cause. Sales are popular because the prices are lower. OK, and that's that's why I said last Friday, you know, the answer to the question, why did the chicken cross the road is maybe the chicken had more than one reason and maybe there's more than one chicken. Rory, uh, what do you see the biggest mistake digital marketers make today um in terms of because because in, in the digital space we ha it's so easy to test you know things like a b testing we can actually test different creatives different messaging at scale really rapidly and optimize but do you think that digital marketers today are not fully taking advantage of that ability to test different things especially counterintuitive ideas and do you have any suggestions on how we can go about implementing some of these seemingly irrational experiments at scale digitally today i mean one of the things you could do is you could create a test pool with five or six other non-competing businesses because i see behavioral science as actually restoring to some extent the imperative for having an advertising industry uh, agency which is that it provides us with a taxonomy of behavioral findings that enables us to transfer a finding in marketing a check chocolate bar to something you might test when promoting a pension. And so the value of the advertising agency as an a, a, a aggregator of findings across disciplines and across categories, which I think is what the advertising agency was va valuable for when it played a more central role in marketing. Uh, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, before it made so much money from TV commercials, it didn't bother to do anything else. You know, if I'm being sceptical. And, and by the way, I think when, ad in, when the ad industry started being paid by the hour rather than paid on commission, it should have reinvented itself in more of a consultative role, but completely failed to do so. It just kept on doing what it was doing before and just charged in a different way, rather than saying, actually, you know, OK, for every problem person out there with a business problem and a media budget, there are 100 people out there with a problem and no media budget. And maybe we can make money talking to them as well. Whereas, you know, I've always had this slight beef, not with our current new business setup, but with advertising new business people who always go, what's their media budget? OK, and I go, I'm not interested in their media budget. I'm interested in the scale of their problem and the scale of the difference we can make for them. Right. Now, that may involve bought media. In fact, quite frequently, it should involve bought media. Um, but nonetheless, what I'm interested in is the economic value we can add by uh, a mixture of creativity and behavioral science. We were not paid on commission. We haven't been paid on commission since 1991. So what the hell are we asking how big the media budget is? We should be asking well, how big a difference we can make. And I think most ad agency people still go around going, we make money in proportion to the number of ads we make. I think we should make money in proportion to the number of problems we solve. You know, you know, call, call me old fashioned, right? But that would be a better incentive and a better kind of, um, uh, a, a, you know, a, a better way to actually incentivize and shape the advertising agency than this ludicrous business where you kind of make money by producing communications, not by solving problems. Producing the communications is very much part of the problem solving process, but it's not the only one, as John Lennon said. Um, no, he didn't. Um, but um, I think this point is just I think this point is just really interesting because um, 
there are lots of people out there who really want to have a marketing conversation with somebody about their problem. Now, they probably aren't in charge of some huge comm spend. But nonetheless, we, you know, and so I think this, this business where the agency can act as a clearinghouse for interesting findings and discoveries, and quite a lot of, I think, the, the truth of the matter is with behavioural science, there aren't actually laws and rules, but there are recurring patterns. And one of the things would be, I would argue, is that I don't think the people doing the performance marketing are necessarily testing crazy enough things. Because it's quite often the weirdly counterintuitive and strange things that have the, what you might call the 10x effects or the really big multiplier effects. And in fact, someone who worked in performance marketing told me this interesting finding that um, the more things you test, in any given test cycle, the more successful you are. Now, you'd expect that, okay? What was weird is it was kind of disproportionate in that people who tested eight different things were achieved much better gains, much, much better gains than people who, had, who tested four. More than you would expect through simply the law of averages. And his theory was that the more things people are testing, the more they're testing things that are counterintuitive or odd. And it's those things which tend to deliver the real kind of pay dirt. So how do you think marketers today should use data or if they should use it at all? Oh, no, what no, do you no, think no, the no, role no. It, it should play? Uh, I'm totally, I'm t I always get stereotyped as this guy. And I think marketers should understand economics because economics is a way of looking at the world. It's a very narrow way of looking at the world. And it sacrificed an awful lot of insight and nuance in order to achieve mathematical neatness or comprehension, which I think is a is a naughty thing to have done uh, for a discipline that enjoys the influence that it does. Nonetheless, I think you should understand economic theory because sometimes the right answer is to drop the price. Okay, don't get me wrong. Okay, I'm not suggesting every you know every single thing in the world uh, you know has to you know effectively do the opposite of what makes sense. That would be you know, strange. Um, uh, and I, I think you should use data. I think you should look at it. By the way, I think sometimes what you should do is just read it as a human being. Just get a data set and read through it. Because you may notice things which, you know, the, the human brain is very, very good at pattern recognition. Okay. You know, I think you should actually, you know, give it as a, you know, and I think you should also experiment with different forms of presentation of the data. I think that whole thing of data is beautiful and brilliant graph making uh, has a very important role to play in helping us understand what's really going on. Um, uh, and I, uh, but I don't think you should venerate data. In other words, I don't think you should make data, you know, adequate data, a precondition for any action you take. Because, and secondly, I think um, you should also be conscious of the fact that, as I said, statistics aren't really facts. In fact, statistics, once you, once you engage in the act of averaging, as Mark Ritson says, the average is the enemy of the marketer, okay? You know, the marketer should not be interested in averages because averages actually are perfectly adequate, okay, if all you're doing is reporting up to shareholders. If you're reporting financial in information up, what you what you want is stuff that aggregates. That's all you need to know about. It. Does it aggregate? Can I, you know, can this data produce an interesting bullet point that I show to an investor? Because the investor isn't interested in what makes your customers different. He's only interested in how, how many they are and how valuable they are on average. Now, the marketer can't afford that luxury of aggregation and averaging. Because the marketer has to ask the question, what's really going on in the marketplace? which is not the same as how much money are you making and what's your growth rate. And so one of the things we've got to be very alert to is the fact that most of the data that's collected by business is basically collected for the purposes of greed. You know, it's reporting on to some stockholder or whatever. And as a result, the data we actually collect um, is unrepresentative in many, many ways. It all comes from the past, not the future. Now, I know that's a banal point, but it's a very relevant point in terms of the representativeness problem. And what we collect tends to be aggregated, 
and numerical, okay? And merely understanding that stuff for reporting up is probably enough to satisfy most, but not all, um, in, in potential investors or stockholders. I would have thought the, um, I and mean, here's a question again. Let me give you an example. Electric cars, right? Um, what we're what we're typically collecting is how many okay how many how many electric cars is ford selling how many electric cars is tesla selling what's the level of growth in the sales okay me personally okay and this is true of any new technology i've got one killer question which i think comes before that which is it doesn't matter whether people are starting to buy electric cars very slowly or whether they're now buying them very fast but well, it does matter. I mean, it's typically a sort of sigmoid curve of adoption of any technology. But there's another really critical question, which is how many people who buy an electric car then go back to a petrol car? And the reason that question is so important is there are some things, you know, that are second life, they're a flash in the pan. Everybody wants to try them. They generate a lot of noise, but nobody goes on to use them permanently or repeatedly, okay? Then there are other things, the opposite extreme, the Japanese toilet. I've got one. Nobody buys one, but anybody who does buy a Japanese toilet never goes back to wiping their ass with paper at home. OK, the air fryer is one of those products which once you've had it, you can't envisage life without it. And that now that strikes me as, you know, now there aren't that many people who've had an electric car for three or four years, but going to those people and and continually measuring the extent to which people who go to electric then defect back and i suspect by the way it's very very low uh, i've got an electric car i wouldn't go back to a petrol car partly because it would feel a bit environmentally weird but partly because the driving dynamics of an electric car are just extraordinarily agreeable by which i mean is a kind of fifty thousand pound or forty thousand pound electric car kind of drives like a rolls royce or it drives like a Ferrari, depending on how you want to drive it. You know, how likely is it if people have had a car that can drive like a Rolls Royce and can drive like a Ferrari, that you actually go back to owning a Rolls Royce and a Ferrari? You know, interesting question. But that's the kind of question I'm interested in, which is an individualized behavioral question. It's not the same as the aggregate question. You mentioned uh, Ferrari and Rolls Royce there which are typically, uh, you know, they're really good cars, but they're also huge status symbols. And um, I was just curious if you have a take on how status symbols and status signaling is evolving, especially in the digital age, right? How do yeah. people go about signaling their status just digitally without these physical goods like we used to get in the past, which we still do, but not as much. This is really interesting because I was quite early. I mean, the signaling uh, work really was done by biologists before economists cottoned on. Um, and uh, it, it, to my credit, I'm, I've always been a huge reader of biology and evolutionary biology. Um, I was funny enough, I was born in the same small, tiny village in Wales where Alfred Russell Wallace was born. I don't know if there's something in the water there that makes you really interested in evolutionary biology. Um, I also went to the same college as Darwin. So I've been kind of, you know, it's, it's just been in the background all my life. And I've always seen, by the way, um, evolutionary psychology as foundational to behavioral science. Not all behavioral scientists do, but I've always argued, look, um, if you see a bias and you realize that in the evolutionary environment or in many ways, the bias makes sense when seen through an evolutionary lens. Uh, then you have to pay extra attention to that bias because it may well be kind of innate. And it may be there for a reason. It's just a more subtle reason than economists can get their head around. And signaling undoubtedly comes into that category, you know. Obviously, Veblen spotted it, okay, with the idea of the Veblen good and the theory of the leisure class in the 19th century. But Veblenomics didn't really take off because, again, because it involves psychology, it makes it a bit less mathy. And, you know, I think, you know, the last sort of 70 years of economics has been a slightly 
misdirected project to try and pretend it's physics. Keynes, Keynes didn't use many equations. I've no idea what Keynes's maths was like, but you read Keynes, Adam Smith didn't use a single equation, right? He used words. And I think this mathiness, um, particularly when economists probably aren't all that good at statistics compared to really serious, you know, pipe hitting statisticians, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I think they're good, obviously, they're better than me, but I don't think they're absolutely at the peak of mathematical ability, if I'm being blunt about it, okay, because if they were, they'd probably be doing maths. Um, I think that mathiness is interesting, because, um, uh, so, uh, because, so, so when, when economics had these insights, if they weren't actually mathematically expressible, it tended to discard them, because, you know, the model didn't have any room for abstract nouns. So the signaling question and the status question is really interesting. Now, I have to give him full marks for prescience because Geoffrey Miller, who wrote Spent and the, um, the Mating Mind, he predicted that social media would change what status goods were. Because previously, OK, people didn't see you on holiday, but they knew what car you had in your drive. Now, in a city, interestingly, people see what you wear, um, uh, but they don't know your car. Now, OK, if you're a total car nut, you can brag on social media about your car. But for whatever reason, people don't, because it can be seen as a bit offensive. And, you know, so, you know, if you show your new Ferrari, then one of your friends will go, ooh, it's not very environmentally friendly. And, you know, you'll get into a whole lot of grief. Whereas, weirdly, flying long haul on an eco holiday to Machu Picchu is totally fine. So Jeffrey Miller predicted back in the um, very early days of social media, this will change not not the innate human preoccupation with status and signaling but it'll change the currencies we use to signal and so it's always very interesting to look at that but that's that signaling thing is vitally important because you can't understand human behavior until you understand which well, what's so strange about this is adam smith understood this absolutely you know adam smith in both books uh, wrote fairly extensively about you know uh, you know, he, he talked about watches as very much a, a, a Veblen good, you know, that people will spend 50 guineas extra to get a watch that tells the time one second better, even though that improvement seems, you know, pretty trivial to the prime job of a watch, which is making sure you, you're not late for an appointment. Well, nobody actually sort of excoriates you for being seven seconds late for a meeting. So um, he, he points out that, you know, these kind of you get these kind of signaling wars where people automatically compete on actually fairly arbitrary measures of superiority. I mean, what's so weird about Ferraris when you think about them is that probably, I don't know, 50% of the Ferraris in, um, uh, in Britain are found in London or the Southeast where there's almost nowhere enjoyable to drive them for the first. I mean, driving a Ferrari out of London is probably more painful than driving, you know, a, you know, a, a, I don't know, a, a, a Kia or, a, you know, a Skoda out of London, right? They're particularly bad cars for urban driving. And so, you know, what they are is not really, um, they're there to show off their motoring uh, characteristics, not really to deliver on it. And so, so understanding, I think, the human need for signaling, understanding, by the way, evolutionary forces like habit and social proof, which is, if you think about it in evolutionary terms, it would be deeply stupid for humans not to have a, a strong tendency, A, to do what I've always done, because I'm still alive, therefore repeating my past habits is a better guide to survival than continual random experimentation. And secondly, social proof, do what everybody else does. Because I'm in this strange place and everybody seems to be eating the pink berries, but they're not eating the blueberries. That may mean they've got a good reason not to eat the blueberries and to eat the pink ones. And since all those people seem to be following that particular course of action, it would make sense for me to copy it without necessarily having to find out for myself that the blueberries happen to be poisonous. So social proof and habit which are two incredibly strong forces in human behavior, in evolutionary terms, it's completely rational. You know, 
Don't learn from your mistakes, learn from other people's mistakes, right? You know, um, you spoke about evolution and, you know, um, how we how we form habits. Um, I just want to I just want to talk about explore versus exploit and the trade off that yes. comes specifically in the business context. So, for instance, um, while Ajay Banga was um, head of MasterCard, he used to talk about how 10 percent of their revenue would go straight towards innovation and just testing ideas, which probably would never lead to anything commercially successful but 10% of the revenue goes straight to experimentation and innovation. Um, and He's, so do you- By the way, can I say, you, you, I've, seen, I've seen various talks he gave during the pandemic, AJ mm -hmm. Banger. I think he's absolutely brilliant. I think, I think he's an extraordinarily um, astute guy, I have to say, slightly in awe of him. Um, same, same, but, pretty but much. Actually, actually, he's part of a really interesting Indian diaspora into Western marketing positions which I think has been entirely to the good. Because I think, first of all, um, as, as a Sri Lankan friend of mine explains, he says that in Sri Lanka and in India, um, you know, the Chartered Institute of Marketing, marketing is seen on a par with accountancy. It's seen as an actual, uh, you know, a serious discipline. Um, and so it attracts um, a, a, a very well, very good people who are also very, very good at marketing education. Uh, better than we are here, I think. But also it has this, uh, you know, brilliant, I, I think, you know, it's a cultural thing about the, the acceptance of ambiguity. My, fr my friend um, Jag Bala, uh, who himself is of, he's, he's part of the Indian diaspora, he always says it's partly because you're polytheistic, that you, you accept that there might be more than one reason for things. And he always accuses Westerners of being monotheoristic, which is you have to have one theory that explains everything. And but 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 no, I mean his his point about that is actually um the only thing about that 10% of experimentation, which can be bad, so I talk about the bees, that bees allow a certain number of bees don't follow the waggle dance, they go off at random. And they are kind of pathfinder bees. In other words, they you know, they 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 won't each individual bee journey stands a very high chance of being a waste of time. So if you measure the efficacy of them per journey, they're low. But one in a thousand journeys might lead to a mega discovery, which completely redirects the efforts of the hive going forward, because the hive is always in danger of becoming over optimized on the past because the data in the waggle dance reflects what it already knows, not what it doesn't know. Okay. And in statistics, in everything else, what you don't know is as important as, this is why statistics are so dangerous. What you don't know is often as important as what you do know. Okay. Um, but of course, by dint of the fact that you don't know it, okay, right, you tend to optimize on what you do know which is a backwards facing thing. Now, in any changing environment where, for example, you know, uh, some cows may break into a field and eat all the flowers, and suddenly where you thought there was a rich supply of pollen and nectar, there's nothing, right? The, the random bees are out there discovering the new field that's just come into bloom. Or the fact that three miles away to the south, in the opposite direction of travel, to the direction of travel the other bees were going in, there's this new and totally untapped source of pollen or nectar or resin, I think are the three things they collect. Okay. Now what's important now, I just need to make a really important caveat about that. It's only worth investing in the rogue bees in the random bees, if the random bees share, right? If the random bees report by dint of a waggle dance, they report their findings back to hive central, then generally, they're extremely valuable. If you don't have that information loop closed, in other words, they go off, make a discovery and keep it to themselves. Okay, then now, so let's take a sales force. I always ask this question about sales forces. If you're a salesman and you discover there's just this great technique, right? Okay, now you would want your salesman maybe to take 10% of customers and experiment with them, okay? And maybe, I don't know if you read Robert Cialdini's books. Yes, um, pretty original. Robert Cialdini is great. His great insights came from basically embedding himself in sales forces. Okay. 
And uh, the fascinating thing there is that um, um, my worry would be that I think quite a lot of salesmen have probably discovered a little intro or a little solution or a little hello, okay, which makes them 25% better at selling, okay? I bet they don't share it with the other salespeople, or maybe they share it with two mates and keep it secret. Why? Because actually, your best approach as a salesman in a business is being better than the other salesman. Okay? If you're incentivized for being salesman of the year, and you discover something really clever, you're not going to share it with everybody else, right? And actually, what you need is a culture where the sales force actually say, I've discovered that if you ring someone up and you say this thing, they're much more likely to take the call. You want them to share that with all the other sales folk. My hunch is they probably don't. And so it, it, AJ Bang is absolutely right. But the caveat there is you have to have a case where when they discover something valuable, the people in that 10% of experimental space um, and by the way, I don't think it's, I, I mean, where he's saying it may come up with nothing, uh, what I think he means is so, in, so any given, essentially, in any given essentially, year. Essentially, mm. yeah, essentially how it works is in any given year, he, he passes on this budget to um, the head of uh, research or R&D or innovation, and uh, her only target is to, within two years, have two commercially successful products with that budget. So there is there is something to hit. Yeah, no, and so two, two years, two years, not one is crucial. And actually, yeah. if you look at the extraordinary stock market valuation he's achieved for Mastercard, um, uh, he's very fair himself. He argues that the, the the Mastercard campaign for everything else there's Mastercard. Yeah, uh, which I think is one of the greatest um, ad campaigns of the last twenty or thirty years. Okay. Um, uh, the for for everything else there, there's mastercard did did predate his arrival but nonetheless the extent to which he's parlayed the brand value of that business into the billions is really really spectacular and fantastic so how how would you go about i, I would that, love, that... i would love to be their head of innovation by the way because I, I i was always trying to one of the things i tried to do uh, years ago which was driven by my behavioral science and behavioral finance readings was simply create a credit card which had two pins a pin for money you were going to pay off at the end of the month and a pin for something you were going to pay off over time now there's no reason you can't have a card which has three separate pins now actually you could argue contactless purchases should actually be paid off um, at the end of the month, okay? If I buy a cup of coffee, I shouldn't get into debt to buy a cup of coffee, okay? Because once I've drunk it and pissed it out, it's done its task, I should pay for those things as I go through life. On the other hand, if I buy a sofa, okay, or I buy, um, you know, uh, uh, an electric bike, since I'm using that electric bike for the next five years, paying for it on credit isn't totally unreasonable, right? And I've always thought there should be a credit card which allows you at the time of purchase to say, what kind of purchase is this? Therefore, how should I pay it off? And I've been kind of ranting about that for ages, and I think it'd be a great thing. Switching over back to um, the agency world, uh, how relevant do you think agencies are today? Um, because your perspective is very much that mar marketing should be seen as a source of value creation and not as a cost to the business. And so it's intrinsically tied to the product itself. And the best companies like Tesla pretty much have products as a form of marketing, has their CEO as a yeah. form of marketing. So <clears throat> how, 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 wh how do you think agencies should operate today? Because if, if what you're saying is true, then companies should just go about that innovation in-house and do their marketing in-house. So how should an agency come into the picture and what value can an agency and outside thinking bring today? Well, I mean, first of all, um, uh, creativity, because I don't think behavioral science without creativity is uh, actually playing with a full deck. I think you have, to, you have to translate the what is to a what if for behavioral science to do its job. And that's essentially a creative function. Secondly, you know, let's say scarcity bias, okay, that's quite, you know, or choice architecture. There's, you know, there's an awful lot of information on choice architecture and scarcity bias, which replicates extremely well, okay, it's a reliable and robust finding. 
But taking someone in and saying, actually, we've got a travel website. How do we reinvent the choice architecture? Okay. There are two things you have to do there, which I think an agency might be better at sometimes than a client. One of which is the just the act of imagining different alternatives. The other one is to say, well, actually, we've also got a client in this business. So we've got a client who runs a dating app and they found this out about choice architecture when people are dating. Now, you could actually say that the business of dating on Tinder and the business of finding a holiday may have some recurring patterns to them. Why don't we borrow what they found on their dating app and deploy it in the travel industry? So the reason I think agencies can be creative is partly it's because it's what they reward. OK, so if you are very, very creative within a very large financial institution, uh, you're more likely to get punished than you are to get rewarded, to be honest, because, you know, it's very easy to become stereotyped as wacky Dave. You know, I had a wonderful there was a very, very good creative client for a long time at British Airways who had the great disadvantage of being Dutch and creative. Because if you suggest something creative if you, and you're Dutch, um, in the uh, in the British business world, people tend to go, Jan, what have you been smoking? <laughs> okay. the, the Dutch having a bit of a reputation as being stoners, which is largely undeserved, I think. Okay, but first of all, the incentive structure and the the, the ad agency is set up to generate these ideas and to re reward the people who have them in a way that may not be reliably true within a, another business organization where getting things out on time or under budget is the principal determinant of business success. OK, I still don't think even ad agencies, I don't think reward ideas proportionately to their value in the people who have them. You know, I think there should be millionaire creative teams. You know, I think if you've had one of those compare the meerkat ideas, I think you should end up, you know, rich. And I, you know, I don't think that happens. I don't. I don't think we incentivize those huge ideas to the extent we perhaps should. Are you saying it doesn't um, happen now, or it happened in the Mad Men era? Uh, it it sort of happened in the Mad Men era, I think, a bit. Um, uh, but uh, agencies have been very financialized, and to be honest, you know, um, you know. A, a skill at financial reporting uh, is just as valuable. Than I always, uh, partly payment by the hour is problematic in this respect. I mean, I always teasingly say that, you know, if I if I discovered a cure for cancer, people in the agency would be quite excited and they might name a meeting room after me. But, um, uh, you know, if I negotiated up the blended hourly rate with Unilever by 0.7%, they'd be just as excited, you know. Um, but, but ad agencies have that incentivization uh, for creative. They have the tolerance of employing people who uh, couldn't work full time within a large um uh, a, a larger more conventional i there are lots of businesses i couldn't work in okay temperamentally if you if i were in a business where they said you know i had to obey all the rules on like claiming expenses you know like you cannot i know i'm afraid you cannot claim this expense for dry cleaning in your hotel room because it is only valid for a stay of five nights or more okay if i couldn't basically break the rules a little bit in those things i just find that environment completely intolerable I'll, I'll give you an example of something i couldn't cope with which is the rule that you have to go second class on trains even when there are first class tickets available for less okay that's the kind of thing i just you know those kind of petty rules and the, the demand for complete conformity and behavior uh, if i had to get in at nine o'clock every morning i couldn't work there okay couldn't do it it's, it, it's not really that I couldn't get in at nine o'clock. I'm sure if I worked for Goldman Sachs and they pay me a Goldman Sachs salary, I'd be pretty punctual. But I just find those things culturally very difficult. So it's partly who we can hire, what they're incentivized to do. Um, we can hire people full time who, you know, you wouldn't want on your books full time if you're an um, insurance company. OK, but then part of it is actually this question of information sharing between and I think behavioral science is valuable because it's highly collegiate. And the fact that you can actually take a finding from one place and deploy it in a completely different business sector, that's hugely valuable. This is the lateral category analysis that mm. you guys do, right? My God, you're well, well done. You're very, very well informed. <laughs> Sam Tatum's book, 
<coughs> Sam Tatum's new book, Evolutionary Ideas, has a lot to do with lateral category analysis. And the idea that, and I think this is kind of true, it's a, there's a Soviet era problem solving methodology called TRIZ. And it stands for something in Russian, that T-R-I-Z is the thing to look for. I think it's a theory of problem solving ideas or something. Um, and um, one of the sort of mantras of this TRIZ philosophy, which I think is pretty good, is that actually your problem has already been solved. It's just been solved in a different domain to yours and nobody's noticed. Um, and so that's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of, I think, really, really interesting thing where um, uh, I, I think agencies still have a, a value. The only problem I have is paying them by the hour because the value we create, if a large part of our value is information sharing, okay, well, that's not a time consuming activity. It's just very valuable. And creativity, another part of our value, uh, is again, not really uh, proportionate to hours spent. Value generated is not proportionate to hours spent. So what you see is in a world which basically prices things by hours spent, I think you overweight your administrative functions and overweight the extent to which the agency performs time consuming activities for a client, rather than the time an agency would spend performing really valuable activities for a client. So I don't think our incentives are well aligned at all. No, but nonetheless, I think those two things are still important. So do you think the consulting model like the BCGs and McKinsey's of the world is better where their success is tied to the success of their idea and the product well, success well, itself? Well, is, is, it, is it though? I mean, I mean, they're very largely paid by the hour. That's um, true. Okay. Uh, they, 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 they may have some sort of success. You've got to be also very careful with that, by the way, because if you improve efficiency of things, according to that kind of tailorist or shallow tailorist model, okay, You've got to be very careful paying by results there because those activities are nearly always successful at first. And they're successful at first because they tend to define success in terms of the expected outcome and the hidden costs of whatever it is you're doing only emerge later. OK, so that business, OK, you know, a typical, you know, a bad McKinsey approach would be we've reduced the let the wage bill of your call center by 25 percent by b bringing in these blah, 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 blah. OK, now, if the consequence of that is a 25 percent saving on the wage bill, McKinsey can claim the credit for that and then waltz off into the sunset with a la la large bag of cash. If the other and unmeasured outcome is lower customer satisfaction which leads to an increase in the in the churn rate okay that only becomes apparent maybe one or two years later by which time you've already written the check i think an awful lot of what is considered to be progress in contemporary capitalism is merely shifting uh, is merely translating visible cost savings into invisible costs so you save cost in something in something you're measuring only to create a cost somewhere you're not measuring and then you declare that thing a success because you're marking your own homework effectively so you spoke and, and by the way it's interesting that when you talk about management consultants to anybody in in a client business uh, your clients always go oh christ don't talk to me about x it's not like these people are welcomed like heroes that generally they're coming in with a pretty narrow model, uh, with a you know a, 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 a repetitive model, which they may well have deployed on some of your own competitors. So the net result is you're becoming more alike your competitors, right? What's what's the biggest thing? I, I'm I'm fairly willing to bet Procter and Gamble don't make very heavy use of consultants. I may be wrong, but I'm willing to bet that Prop G, if you go and look at PNG's consulting bill, it isn't all that huge. And I, I um, what's so interesting about that is that the, the people who really know what they're doing um, have a healthy skepticism towards this stuff. And I, I, I so so I mean, one of the things would be, I mean, for example, one of the biggest trends we, we'll see whether this holds up in a kind of uh, a kind of inflationary crisis and a cost of living crisis. 
But an awful lot of the success of businesses over the last few years has been premiumization. Um, and, you know, what that means, it's not to do with cost reduction. It's to do with creating what they've discovered is there are a lot of people with a lot of discretionary um, income who will pay more for better. Or perhaps what they want is actually less of better, not more of the same. Okay. What would an okay. example of that be? Uh, drinks, alcoholic drinks category, undoubtedly. Um, actually, the um, uh, FMCG categories, you know, dish. Reckitt Benkiser always interests me because they must have someone inside Reckitt who's a really, really smart behavioral scientist because their pricing and their product design, you know, fit, I don't know if you've got a dishwasher, but, you, um, but finish quantum. This yep. idea of having an insanely expensive dishwasher tablet at the top, which occasionally gets sold at 50% off, but I'm sure still profitably, okay? But the reason they created that was to make their other products seem cheaper. They do, I'm sure they make money out of it, but having this kind of hero product, which partly exists to make the ordinary dishwasher tablets seem comparatively reasonable. That's kind of smart, you know, what, what, what Reckitt Benkiser seem to do is some pretty smart shit. And I'm, I'm convinced that they've got someone in there, may have been, you know, maybe the marketing director for all I know, who either instinctively or through education is a pretty damn good behavioral scientist. But I mean, you see it in, okay, you know, um, what would be a classic case in P&G, oil, uh, oil of Ole, for example, okay, where they took that from a sort of four pound price point to a 20 something pound price point. What, what do you think about subscription service models? Uh, that's getting increasingly popular, both online as well as offline. Oh, like, yeah. I worry. They really yeah. worry me. Because, I, I, first of all, I don't, I don't think the media will ever fully thrive. Paywalled media will never fully thrive until they have a, a, a complementary pay-as-you-go option alongside subscription. Because I think no matter how many, um, uh, how rich you are, I think people have a limit to the number of monthly subscriptions they're prepared to in engage in. There's also the risk that when you have economic bad times, large numbers of people just go onto online banking and purge all their recurring subscriptions. You know, it was difficult to cancel before. Cancelling the actual service is difficult. Cancelling the payment may not be. OK, let's put in a little bit of legislation here in the UK, which I think there should be which is that any recurring payment must be marked as such on your credit card bill and it must be possible to cancel it via the credit card bill. And, but actually, what, what's happened is all these people have got, you know, Netflix, they've all got into this one business model. Now, if you're first and you're Netflix, you'll do OK with that. One, it's a problem because, OK, I'll tell you two stories. One person I heard of cancel their subscription to the Telegraph, okay? I think it was, because they thought it was too expensive. Now, this is a really important point, by the way. What's expensive or cheap is much more nuanced as a question than what economists think, okay? They just think it's a question of utility versus price. There's a whole lot of other stuff going on. If you think you are paying the same price for something, which other people get more use out of than you, you feel it's bad value for money, no matter how rich you are, okay? So I've never been able to bring myself to subscribe to the Financial Times. I would happily pay a pound to read an article in the Financial Times, okay? An individual article, I'd pay a pound, right? But because I don't work in finance, because I don't need to read articles about the prospects for central banking reform in Ecuador, right? I feel, well, I'm paying the same amount of money as a Goldman Sachs banker for this shit, and I'm getting 30% of the value, right? So therefore, I'm getting bad value for money, because it's not priced for me, it's priced for him, right? Or her. <laughs> See what I did there? Right? Okay. Now, the point I'm making there is, I had a huge argument with someone from the railway company. Now, okay, this is again, okay, okay. the season ticket, right, is a subscription, right, to a railway, all you can eat subscription to a railway line. 
And I said, if I'm working, th if I'm only going into London three days a week, he said, yeah, but if you get a season ticket, you'll still save money. I don't think it's true, by the way, but I mean, OK, you'll save like a pound a week, right? You'll still save money if you're only travelling into London three days a week. I said, that's not my fucking point, mate. I said, look, the point is that the bastard who's travelling in five days a week is getting better value for money from the season ticket than I am because I'm only travelling in three days a week. So therefore, I think that comparatively it's bad value for money. OK, so obviously under lockdown, everybody got Netflix because when you're under house arrest, you can't leave the house for a year. Naturally, a streaming service is pretty good value for money. OK, what else am I going to do? Right. OK, you know, OK. Now, that fact that we actually judge value with, you know, a comparative lens. Not just a, an absolutist utility price lens is really important because there is a natural limitation to the number of people who will subscribe to things because once you reach that body of people who think I'm getting disproportionately less value from this than other people are. I'll tell you two stories. One, Elon Musk doesn't subscribe to Netflix, okay? Two, the person who cancelled their Telegraph subscription because they thought they weren't using it to the full, okay, was Rupert Murdoch's like son-in-law or something, right? Okay. Now, you know, whoever this person is, I mean, it's not really why well, I can't afford £9.95 a month, right? It's just the fact that if you think you're getting less use of it than other people are, so once you cross that kind of, once you get into the right-hand side of the bell curve, basically you've got a whole load of rejectors. And so I think the whole subscription thing, I, I want to do a, a special nudge stock on subscription where we said the third thing is, as I said, it's dangerous because you might get a load of people who just go cancel, 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 cancel. And, and what's happened is a classic case of the Clay Christensen thing, which is the innovator's dilemma, because you've got a lot of people who are making money on the subscriptions and they're absolutely terrified that if you offer an alternative means of finance or funding, that it'll cannibalize your existing revenue. Now, personally, I don't think it will. I think you can do clever pricing so that actually it doesn't cannibalize your existing revenue. OK. Um, or you can, you know, subscribers can get particular perks and benefits that pay as you go. People don't get, for example, as well as just unlimited use. You know, you can throw in things like the archive. You can throw in other stuff. OK. What about an ad supported model? Uh, well, that's an option, you see. I mean, now what you could do is you could say, I'll give you a classic case where you can make a lot of money out of pay as you go. You're watching crime, a crime drama, right? And what you'd say is, OK, um, uh, you can find out who did it next week, you know, at nine, nine, nine o'clock, BBC One on Monday. OK, or if you pay two pounds, you can watch it right away. Now, that will get a hell of a lot of people paying two pounds to watch episode, the, the concluding episode, right? In a way that, hey, do you want to do you want to pay two pounds for this series up front? No, don't think anybody will do that. But if you say you've watched half the series, bit of sunk cost, bit of, you know, bit of, you know, bit of inquisitiveness peaked. At that point, if you said episode two, you can binge watch it right now. I'm watching a thing on Apple t TV called Tehran. It's fantastic. OK, yeah. it's going to uh, you watch it as well. It's kind of Israeli. No, no, I, 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 I've drama. seen I've seen the, the trailer. Yeah. But they're making they're making me watch it every bloody week. Every Friday, a new episode comes out and I've got to watch it one week at a time, like it's 1972 or something. And it's driving me nuts. I want to binge watch the damn thing. Partly because, you know, I don't have that much free time, but I occasionally, ha you know, I'll occasionally spend three hours and just go, OK, let's just binge watch some telly. OK, you know, that's how I like to watch. So so the, the interesting thing is there that um, the, the subscription alone, it's part of the solution. But if subscription is the only way you can access the content, it's catastrophic. I'm um, just to give an example. I think the seventh or eighth largest group of Guardian readers, OK, are people who hate The Guardian. There's a very large group of Guardian readers who basically read The Guardian to get angry or to generally go on the comments and you know, spout bile or whatever it may be. Okay. Now, those people are never, you know, those people might pay as you go for a Guardian article. They're never going to subscribe, right? Okay, at the moment, it's it's voluntary donations, but you get my point. And, um, uh, you know, you can't do the voluntary donations model doesn't really work if you're a 
PLC or your own via billionaire, does it? You know, I'm not donating money to a billionaire. Um, so, 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 so there's some really interesting stuff here where they undoubtedly have to experiment with complementary models, but they're too frightened to do so because of fear of cannibalization. Switching back to marketing, um, could you talk about the differences uh, between marketing in a B2B versus a B2C context? Using behavioral science, how, how different is it the process of decision making in both these categories? Okay, that's, I think that distinction is always beset by two problems. Okay. One, uh, they're two extreme and stupid comments. One of which is people who sometimes in the advertising industry go, it's just the same, isn't it? Because they're all human beings, right? And therefore B2B marketing doesn't require any special skills or considerations because it's just like consumer marketing. Okay. And the other extreme is the view, which is that once people put on a suit, they become completely rational. They're only interested in price and, and um, performance and specification, and therefore there's no scope for marketing, okay? And those two extreme polarized views are both dramatically wrong, and I think they've bedeviled um, B2B marketing for a long time. And actually the truth of the matter is there's huge role for psychology in B2B. Um, in some cases, I think there's more role, there's, there are more biases in B2B than there are in B2C. And the distinction I always make, which is not, don't, don't take this as exhaustive, but it's just a valid point. When we make a decision as a consumer, we don't generally have to justify it to a panel of colleagues. OK, we don't risk losing our job because uh, we bought the wrong kind of clock radio. OK. Right. Um, and so when we make a decision as a consumer, we're trying to minimize the risk of regret. And we, when we make a decision as a business representative within an institutional setting we're trying to minimize the risk of blame and that's a slight oversimplification as i said it's not exhaustive by any means as an explanation of the differences but it's a fundamental difference no one ever got fired for buying ibm okay and actually in many cases we want to make decisions which are not career threatening in the worst case scenario and I always argue that's why there are big four accounting firms. It's because it's a blame insurance scheme. OK, if you appoint one of the big four and they cock up, everybody blames Price Waterhouse. If you appoint a small boutique um, accounting firm and they make a mistake, everybody blames you for not appointing Price Waterhouse. It's, it's what we call the Heathrow effect, OK, which is when you get a person making a decision for a more senior person, they go into a very peculiar state of, and I suddenly realised this, I hate to say this. How, how long would you, have you worked in ad agencies in total? Up to. Um, okay, so I always thought for 15 years, when you're pitching to a bunch of clients, we saw the clients as all powerful, okay? Despite the fact that in some cases, the marketing department isn't all that powerful within the organisation, okay? And I always thought when you're pitching work to a bunch of clients in a pitch, what they're thinking is, will this work work? Will it build our brand and sell product and do all these good things? And I suddenly realized after 10 or 15 years, they're not really thinking that at all. They're going to think, what will my boss think if I show him this or her? OK. Right. Yeah. Um, now, as a result, or well, that probably is a him, but that's another question. Right. But the point I'm making is that they're much more worried about their boss thinking they're stupid than they are worried about selling 10% fewer widgets, actually. And so if you present something with an animated dancing goat, okay, which might be wonderfully successful, um, if you have a dead serious boss who's trained as an actuary, you're going to face a bit of an uphill struggle. And so I think, I think there's a really interesting question here which is that understanding collective decision making and institutional decision making, there are a whole load of complexities and biases. They're just different biases in many cases. In other words, it's more important to have a good argument than it is to have a good outcome. In consumer decision making, we care about the outcome. How good was that telly I bought? How good was that clock, clock radio? How good was that moped? OK. And if it's good, we're happy. OK. In business-to-business decision-making, 
if we buy a really good, you know, photocopier, but we, we, we haven't got the argumentation to explain to someone why we chose that photocopier versus another photocopier, uh, we've still got a problem, even if it's the best photocopier in the world, because you're not allowed to use heuristics, you're not allowed to use insti instinct, you're not allowed to use kind of, you couldn't say, well, you know, Xerox kind of famous for photocopy, you might be able to do it with something as big as that, okay, not that anybody, you know, I haven't actually made a photocopy for two years, you know, it's weird. Um, but you might you might be able to say, you know, you might buy a Xerox photocopier because no one's going to question why you bought a Xerox photocopier, okay? You know, it's a bit like buying Coca-Cola. I always say that it's a very weird thing in drinks, okay? There are drinks which require explanation and there are drinks which don't. So if you're in a pub in the UK, I don't know what it's like in India, um, in Singapore as well, but if you order beer, that's fine. If you order cider, you when people are doing the round, what do you have to drink? You just say, oh, I'll just have a beer. Or I'll have a draft beer. Or I'll have a so-and-so. Fine. No questions asked. If you want a cider, you've actually got to add a couple of sentences of explanation. Have you noticed that? Well, actually, it's a very hot day. And weirdly, I feel like a cider. It's, it's exactly what I call the difference between ordering a Coke and ordering a Dr. Pepper. You know? You know, one of them is just, yeah, well, obviously, yeah, you're having a Coca-Cola. You're not drinking. You know, it's absolutely fine. What else would you have, right? And if you say, oh, you know, I want a Dr. Pepper, you know, that actually creates what you might call, that actually d creates comment and demands justification. And that makes the decision much more painful than a decision that doesn't look like a decision. I'm always intrigued by this. I'm also intrigued, actually, because I'm a big cocktail fan. Very good. Singapore's pretty good for the old mixology, isn't it? Um, uh, and um, But it's very interesting that it's now reached a point, and I always talk to spirits brands about this, that wine is now so expensive by the bloody glass that you might as well have a cocktail. You know, you know, it, it used to be when I was, a, you know, when I was like 25, if you asked for a, a you know, I'm not, you know, even a gin and tonic, never mind a pina colada or a strawberry daiquiri. Oh, sorry about this. The phone's ringing. Wait a second. Uh, so, um, no, so what, what's so interesting about this is that um, uh, B2B, uh, I think there's huge scope for creativity in B2B, and actually there already has been a lot of very good B2B creative work produced. Um, the, um, so, so I, I, you know, I, I, I also think, by the way, that B2B marketing has attracted too little attention because the media budgets are generally smaller, but the actual scope for marketing thinking may be actually greater. You know, and I think that there's there as a result, there's much more remaining ceiling in raising the game in B2B marketing. I think there's more potential to really change the game uh, if you're working with a B2B client than there is if you're working with a B2C client. And by the way, all it does require, it's fair to say, generally, uh, you need a longer, deeper relationship. We've got some great B2B specialists within Ogilvy. And what you notice about them is they actually understand their clients' businesses in the round slightly better, I think, than the people who work on B2C brands. Because I think in B2B, you have to understand the whole equation. You know, how, who buys these things? What's the decision-making process? You know, what, you know, you have to consider also that things like... Um, you know, webinars or seminars or exhibitions may be part of your media mix. You know, there are a lot of things you need to understand. And so I think you need longer running relationships with with deeper, more entrenched um, agencies in B2B to deliver the full value. Because and, and also, you know, in terms of creative people, it just requires a little longer to get your head around it, doesn't it? Generally, you know, it's pretty obvious what crisps are, you know. You know, but, uh, uh, you know, if you've got a, you know, a client who sells industrial pumping equipment, well, obviously the learning curve is going to be that little bit steeper. What do you think about the synergies between creative agencies and media agencies or creative and media in general? Because typically oh. these get siloed out into two separate I never, I never, under, I never understood the rationale for separating them. It made yeah. no sense. Separating media buying might have made sense, okay, at some level. 
Okay, I never understood the rationale for separating out media planning from the creative agency. I mean, I, I, other than it's other than a few been... agencies like Gary Vaynerchuk's, I think everybody has moved on from the Mad Men era. It's typically too separate right now. And what I uh, see is I that think, I think well, well, I think CHI in the UK is an outlier as well. I think okay. they insist on having media within the business, and because... I would argue it's not, it's not a proper business without it. I mean, my only hope is that technologies like Zoom mean that we can actually work, and actually that in WPP's campus approach in fairness okay but it is a classic case of something which is done not to serve the client not to serve the ability of the business itself but to le but to create greater legibility for the investor community so the entire focus of that activity was not to improve the life of clients or to improve the quality of work produced by agencies it was to be able to tell more nuanced stories to um, to shareholders and, uh, and investors and banks, there was there was no case there was no case blah 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 economies of scale. I mean, the trouble with economies of scale is that they're now treated as axiomatic. Actually, there are diseconomies of scale. There are inefficiencies of scale, um, and uh, I, I never understood that. I, to be honest, I've never enjoyed my work quite to the same extent since media left. They were a different kind of person. They were cognitively complementary to the people you've got in a creative department. They were hungry deal makers. Um, they were actually, I always used to love it because back in the back in the old days when we were full service, what I used to say was it's very simple, okay, this creative job. If you've got an approach and the creative person likes it and the planner likes it and the media person likes it, you're onto something, right? You know, as a creative director, I kind of go, OK, if, it, if it's if it's creatively interesting enough to get the creative people excited, if it's strategically robust enough, OK, uh, to to uh, to do the job that the planner believes needs to be done and it's fundamentally workable in terms of the scale of the audience it reaches and the way it makes use of the complementary strengths of different media to attract the media person then you're kind of off to the races. Then it's just the job of the account person to check the client realizes how good it is. And since we've lost that third leg of the stool, I'm very vociferous about this. I think it was one of the stupidest decisions. You could argue it was a necessity because of the, um, uh, the um, funny enough, Brazil, I don't think. There are no media independence in Brazil. I've got some vague idea they're illegal. Um, and interesting, they do very good creative work. Funny that, isn't it? Um, but um, I don't think um, I don't think the business has ever been quite as good since they made that split. I just want to switch the conversation from marketing to the startup world. Uh, being a startup founder myself, a, a lot of my audience as well are, are startup founders here in Singapore and Asia in general. Um, and I, I just want to ask you, how can startup founders, uh, people looking to build new products, innovate around new solutions, how can they go about uh, testing counterintuitive ideas? How can they go about the process of innovation, as you call it, exploring psychological tendencies and trying to innovate around that, like how you said Uber does? Maybe you can talk about that a bit and how, how people can essentially go about this process of generating new ideas and testing them. Startup founders. Um, uh, how can startup founders uh, effectively go about uh, oh, I think in this case, you might, it's simply a very good question, which is, if any business you're considering, one, has a behavioral insight at its core, and two, that behavioral insight has been underexploited by other competitors in the field, there, there are Silicon Valley investors who actually argue that they look for something slightly irrational or weird about any idea before they're prepared to invest in it. And if you think about it, TikTok, OK, now, I don't know why TikTok succeeded and Vine failed, but it's based around the idea of a constraint. Twitter around the idea of a constraint. Uh, you know, I think Facebook was successful because it made the choice architecture for Facebook posters manageable in a way that in my space it simply wasn't. Unless you were a 17 year old girl who wanted to have weird burning things at random places on the page, you know, nobody middle aged would ever have gone onto MySpace. Okay. And therefore, it actually imposed 
manageable choice architecture on the person participating. I think Facebook was a choice architecture play. I think Google was a design play, which is, if you think about it, at the time when Google came along, uh, one of the reasons why Google didn't necessarily realize its true value until later is people wrongly thought that the, what you might call the, um, uh, the AOL Yahoo model of content and search functionality in one place was, you know, uh, that that would the portal was the dominant idea not the search engine and i think what google exploited although it has to be said that you know um alta vista and ask jeeves also did something similar beforehand albeit less elegantly and less effectively let's not deny the fact that google was very very good okay i'm not suggesting that the quality of your product is in is irrelevant to success but nonetheless um you know uh, there's a, a known human bias, which is sometimes called the um, jack of all trades um, heuristic, which is if you do only one thing, people tend to assume you're very good at that thing, and they tend to perceive how good you are at that thing. If you do multiple things, uh, in other words, you're a portal, okay, oh, look, there's a sports score, there's the weather, there's the latest news from your area, there's a search engine, all on this crowded page, not the same. Google's brilliant idea was realizing perhaps you didn't have to have advertising on page one, that the place to put advertising was on page two, effectively after you'd searched. But, oh. but no, I, so understanding those things and having and developing an instinct for them, I think is really, really vital. It's, it's very similar to PayPal back in the day. Um, they were trying to be an all in one fintech solution and they had uh, pretty much a bunch of uh, you know payment processing related services. But the one thing that Elon Musk's investors were amazed at is sending money over email. And that one little feature is, is what they went all in on. And that's how PayPal kicked off. So you're right, a, lo a lot of Silicon Valley's companies, uh, but again, they had to go through that process of having multiple features, multiple functionalities, going after different kinds of um, users and markets before they had that epiphany moment that this is the one thing that worked. No, no, I will, very often, um... Uh, actually, it's the one killer function. This is what you might call an affordance if you are using that Don Norman language. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the same thing I wrote about in Alchemy was I think it's Akio Morita who vetoed the recording functionality for the Walkman. It would have cost only a few cents because the Walkman was based basically on the chassis of a dictaphone. Okay, you don't know what a dictaphone is, do you? you know, okay, you probably, I keep saying things to you. I mean, well, of course, with the fax machine, and all these people are sitting in the audience going, what the hell is this guy talking about? You know, um, but, but he said, no, no, the point about this thing is you listen to music with it. And the second I put recording functionality on the first Walkman, people will start thinking it's something else and it will confuse them. And they won't judge it for the one thing that it does. They'll kind of go, well, it's sort of a dictaphone and it's sort of a music box. And that business of reducing functionality to improve the choice architecture or to narrow the affordances to a level which is readily comprehensible and appreciable is a really, really interesting thing because it is counterintuitive because all the engineers said, well, it only costs 50 cents to put recording functionality in, you know, and to them, that's, you know, that's adding value to the product. But actually, cognitively, it's probably reducing the value of the product. I think that's what's so interesting about it. I want to ask you about formal education, um, specifically tertiary university education. And what do you think um, the role of God, university? You know, you, you, know, you know all my hot buttons, I have to say. <laughs> it's an area of obsession with me because it's turned yeah. into a Veblen good. It's yeah. turned into a... Uh, it's that, essentially, I'm not, I'm not essentially, I, essentially, I want to ask you, what is is it really a predictor of creativity and innovation? What do, what do you see as a, as a common factor I, in people who are innovating? Whether it that's within actually, an agency or within the startup community. Um, it it what, may actually what, lead to a diminution of creativity because the requirement, okay, this is my great problem. The requirement to appear fair and meritocratic, okay, which is really just the justification of an elite, actually. It's the, uh, you know, the elite may be elite for completely different reasons, but the requirement to appear um, uh, uh, democratic and fair and meritocratic requires you to apply the same criteria to everybody. And since people are different, 
replying the same criteria to everybody is by definition unfair. Okay, one thing you'll know from working in an ad agency is, yeah, I would argue a good ad agency needs a few chin-stroking Oxbridge types kicking around the place. They're essential to the ecosystem, okay? But an ad agency which consisted entirely of chin-stroking Oxbridge types would actually be a living catastrophe. Um, and so there are a lot of complementary skills which make a successful ad agency. A lot of them found actually in junior people, not necessarily in senior people, by the way. Uh, it's very, very easy to underestimate that, the value of junior people with very specific talents or energies or focuses. And so I really worry about the extent to which um, higher education, which is supposed to be creating breadth of thinking and as a result a byproduct of curiosity and breadth of thinking, uh, therefore a form of creativity, okay, which tends to result, is actually creating a kind of mindless conformity. But, but it, it, it is a really interesting thing, which is this urge, why do we want the education system to be fair? Well, there are two possible answers to that question. Answer one is um, so, that, um, uh, so that everybody has a fair chance of, of top jobs. Although, although the kind of jobs that university prepares you for is a fairly narrow um, subset of all jobs. The other argument is that some people are going to win those top jobs anyway by dint of social and uh, financial advantages they already possess. But they're desperate that when they do get those top jobs, they can't be accused of, of having acquired them unfairly. And so they create a whole load of guff around, uh, you know, uh, equality of opportunity in order effectively to justify a hierarchy. And it's worth noting that when you talk about equality of opportunity, you are assuming a hierarchical society where there are people of high status who are very well paid and there are people of low status who are less well paid and that all that matters is the people at the top are the people who deserve to be there well you can design societies that aren't like that you know america in the 1950s probably had an extraordinary level of egalitarianism in many ways in that yes okay harvard graduates would have been overrepresented significantly at the top of the civil service but i don't think harvard graduates necessarily would have been overrepresented at the top of the banking industry i mean when i was at university not many people wanted to go into banking right um so i i mean i i i think we we need to be genuinely concerned but also the extent to which uh, the cost of higher education has far surpassed inflation for 20 years, uh, you see extraordinary waste. It was revealed recently that there are more administrators at Yale than there are undergraduates, okay? So for every undergraduate, there's something like 1.1 administrators, not teaching staff, administrators. Well, if you got rid of those administrators, you could actually teach people one-on-one -on -one practically, right? And so the extraordinary a pricing power that education has as a kind of veblen good, as a kind of signaling, uh, signaling of employability. Now, no one cares seven years into a job where you went to university, okay? The reason a university is so valuable is it gets you on that conveyor belt in the first place. And therefore, the half-life value of education is actually quite low in career terms. And so I, I would argue, I would argue there's something actually deeply, um, uh, deeply dubious about the extent to which um, uh, education has gone from being something people wanted for its own sake to make them a better human being and wiser, you know, uh, more creative, uh, more, um, uh, 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 you know, better at problem solving, uh, just simply better at cultural enjoyment. OK, it was something, you know, that was kind of, you know, I, I would argue that when I went to university in the late 80s, there was still a large element that people felt they weren't there to get a job. Uh, you know, they weren't there, certainly not for their first two years. Nobody had any conversations about careers. OK, my first two years at Cambridge. OK, but I think there was still an underlying hangover from the 30s and the 50s that it was a form, you know, you were there to practice a form of self edification. You know, it was there to make you a better person in the future, not to get you a better job. And I think once it's become functionalist, now the interesting question is, you know, why? I mean, okay, 
I mean, okay, if Goldman Sachs said, okay, uh, yes, you can join our graduate program, but it costs you $250,000 to actually be considered as a Goldman Sachs graduate recruit. People would say that's absolutely abominable, right? That's just total profiteering. But if you outsource that function to Yale, Harvard, and MIT, that's okay, apparently. Now, also, it's fair to say that the extent to which uh, no one's adequately innovated in education to scale, to increase it up in scale suggests that they know that it's a scarcity good, that the value of a Harvard degree comes from how few people have one, not on what the Harvard degree actually teaches you. And why would you say and, there hasn't been that innovation in education? Well, there's no, uh, in luxury goods, there's often uh, the worst mistake you can make if you're Louis Vuitton is to have too many bags kicking around. Okay, the scarcity is a large component of the value. And they realize that it only has signaling value, a Harvard degree, if not many people have one. And so uh, it, it, this is, I mean, this is genuinely quite, I think this is genuinely quite frightening because what you're doing effectively is you are undoubtedly giving people access to very well-paid jobs but you're starting them on those well-paid jobs, $200,000 in debt. It really, you know, it really isn't that great, I have to say. What do you make of master's programs? Um, a big fan of the one-year master's in behavioral science, because I, I, I'm not, I mean, there are people like the BIT who want a PhD. I don't know why you'd want a PhD. I don't want somebody who studied one aspect of behavioral science for four years. I, mean, I wouldn't discount someone for having a PhD, obviously, that'd be silly, okay? But I'd never make it a requirement. Whereas one year masters is kind of proof of commitment and interest, okay? There is that value to education, which is if you can hack it, you're probably, it's not just an intelligence test, it's also a grit test or a commitment test, okay? It's a very bad test of your ability to work with other people, I might add because most education evaluates people for their individual output, not for their contribution to a greater whole. So, you know, it's, it's anything but a brilliant uh, proxy measure for employ employment value, I would argue. And I would argue it's completely weird that Goldman Sachs has, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and all these sort of premium employees have actually almost colluded with the university's own game. In dis now, Google, Google's own work suggests that actually degree class and value to Google and subsequent job performance don't correlate. Now, we've got to caveat that because Google isn't employing people from, you know, ra you know, random sink estates, okay? It tends to employ people from top universities to begin with. It simply finds that your performance at a top university doesn't really uh, uh, correlate with employability. But some of Nassim Taleb's work around IQ also suggests that actually the correlation between IQ and life outcome is one directional. Yes, if you have a very low IQ, you will not reach median income, okay? And that was what it was originally designed for. It was detecting people who weren't up to the main school system. But it's not true to say that people with a very high IQ will uh, uh, are very likely to out earn or outperform people with a fairly high IQ. The, 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 the entire correlation is not one is not a, is, is not one with a very good fit. The correlation is mostly driven by the left hand tail. Before I get to a couple of quick questions, um, on a closing note, tell us about your thoughts of the future of advertising and digital marketing in general, for the better or worse, where do you think the industry is headed? What are some of the biggest trends you are seeing? Uh, the most vital thing, and I hope that behavioral science helps do this, and that's partly why I wrote the book, is the elevation of the status and perceived importance of marketing within the wider business and policy making community and actually an appreciation of it within the public at large that actually if the advertising makes you enjoy something more that's perfectly okay okay i think it's perfectly okay for neurofen in australia as they did to sell neurofen for period pain which was chemically identical to ordinary neurofen but had for period pain on the packaging and cost a bit more and the reason is we know the placebo effect is very strong, uh, it, particularly in analgesics, and therefore making it specific to a condition 
is likely to improve its efficacy, even if it's chemically no different. And I think understanding among consumers themselves that actually quite a lot of their, their, their lives might become better, not by actually um, changing their material lives, but by looking at their lives differently. It's very, very easy, I think, to, for example, the over tendency to compare up, I think is massively destructive of happiness. Um, uh, you know, so what tends to happen is as you get richer, you move more and more in circles with people who are even richer than you, which leads to a kind of malcontentment, which I think is, you know, problematic. I think understanding, for example, that hyper competition is actually not a good thing it's as soon as as soon as you're in a space which is hyper competitive get the hell out and find a new space you know because people are inclined to compete even when the price of competition overall doesn't warrant it okay i'm very wary about the extent to which schools encourage people to believe there's a career in classical music uh, in sport uh, or in um theater in drama because schools, interestingly, if you show a great aptitude for plumbing, schools are totally uninterested in that. But if you show an aptitude for drama, they're absolutely all over the place. Now, let's be honest, okay, there are a hell of a lot more well-paid jobs in plumbing than there are in drama, right? In fact, you know, unless you're either very rich or you have nothing to lose, or you have an absolutely spectacular Michael Jordan-ish talent, which cannot fail to manifest itself, okay? You're probably best not trying in drama, you know, playing a musical instrument. Now, if you enjoy doing those things, that's great. That's fantastic, okay? If you enjoy sport, do sport for its own enjoyment. I would argue that if you look at the winner takes all effects and things like, you know, Daniel Kahneman said to me, the worst thing you can dream of is a career in as an actor because you're almost certainly gonna fail the people who make it big as actors almost certainly are not only very good, you may be very good, they're also very lucky, okay? They happen to be in exactly the right place at exactly the right time with exactly the right role, which is then their breakthrough role. And you could be the best person in the world and you may never have your breakthrough role. Okay. But Kahneman's other point was that if you're a mildly successful dentist, you don't open the newspaper on a Sunday and there's a big double paid feature on the world's 10 most successful dentists, okay? You don't have your nose rubbed in it all that often. Whereas if you went to RADA with, you know, or you went to act acting school with, um, you know, um, uh, you know, a Hollywood megastar, you're probably sitting there going, I was just as good as they are. And you may be right, by the way. You know, so, so you know, hyper competition, once you engage in hyper competition, luck plays a much greater part than skill does. If you're in modest competition, it's a skill game which 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 is helped by a bit of luck okay if you're in a hyper competition it absolutely requires supreme skill but it also requires luck luck isn't merely a contributory factor it's a decisive factor and so for people to become better at sort of probabilistic judgment and to understand you know the hidden asymmetries in in life and perception is i think useful for them but uh, but i also think that the appreciation of of these things in, for example, everything from um, uh, uh, marketing to wider business to the investor and financial community. Um, it, it's not going to solve the world's problems overnight, but it just gives a wide, what I always say is, look, the purpose of behavioral science isn't necessarily first and foremost to solve problems. It's to widen the possible solution space. It's to widen the area of exploration. And that's a science, by the way. A science is not a discipline where you have single right answers. A science is, is an inquiry into the reason, into the causes of things. That's all it is. It isn't a quantification of things or the development of mathematical models to explain things to 100% uh, reliability. It's simply, you know, the intelligent inquiry into the, into the reasons behind things. If you can derive a mathematical equation from that, great and dandy. But don't say it's a, you know, it's not a science because you sometimes can't. Apart from anything else, we don't have SI units for human emotions, do we? 
we don't have like you know the unit of regret or the unit of impatience or the unit of uncertainty or the unit of you know mild discomfiture okay we don't have numbers for those things do they affect behavior all the time massively do they fit into a model nope they don't tell us five to ten books that you'd recommend anyone in marketing or innovation in general to check out okay don't be offended if you're not on this list because my list changes all the time um uh, probably spent by jeffrey miller um in no particular order the darwin sure. economy by robert frank uh, common sense un sorry um uncommon sense common nonsense by jules goddard a new way to think by roger l martin um misbehaving by richard thaler um anything by nasim taleb um uh, what else um if you want if you're really mathy uh, there's a guy called Judah, let me get this right, I think he's called Judah Pearl, is that right? Uh, who's written a book called Causation, I think. If you if you want to go really mathy, uh, The Choice Factory and by Richard Shotton, um, I'd add in um, uh, the um, uh, a book called, I think it's called This Tangled World by Gerald Ashley. And there, there are a few, uh, Robert Cialdini, read his books. Um, and there's a there's a book which had a huge influence on me, really. The Economic on. Naturalist. Yeah, that was the Economic Naturalist. That's a, that's a good one. Stephen Landersman, I think that is, isn't it? No, um, that's Robert H. Frank. Oh, that's Robert H. Frank. Sorry, yes. uh, I, I'm trying to think what the, uh, the that's, sorry Stephen Landersman is the Armchair Economist, uh, which is a good book. Uh, by the way, read Adam Smith. You know, I mean, a lot of this. Uh, Aesop was a behavioral scientist. Okay, that's 600 years BC. Okay. Jesus is a very good behavioral scientist. You know, the lost sheep, you know, there's loss aversion uh, there. Um, uh, you know, there's the parable of the vineyard, which is very, very interesting in terms of perceived value and, and comparative comparison of perception. Okay. Um, so just read widely as well. Read novels, watch films. I mean, the great thing about working in advertising, people often say, do you recommend a career in advertising? And I say, yes, for one thing. Okay. The great thing about working in advertising and marketing is that anything you do, any way in which you in indulge your curiosity is potentially valuable. If you're an actuary, going and seeing a French art house movie isn't going to make you a better actuary. <laughs> Only in exceptionally unlikely circumstances, I think it's probably fair to say. I mean, there probably is a French art house movie, you know, <laughs> about a depressed actuary who goes off to a country house and then has sex with somebody and then they go to a restaurant and talk about it. But but what, I, what I'm saying is that um, uh, the great thing about working in this business is that you know, reading Shakespeare, going on holiday and, and sitting in a cafe and watching people go by, wandering around a shop, going on the internet and looking at online commerce. Anything you do to slake your curiosity, okay, will make you better at your job, potentially, or in many cases, you know, reliably, okay? And you can't say that about most jobs. So if you're, if you're curious and nosy as hell, or what David Ogilvy called in his definition of a good copywriter, an extensive browser in all kinds of fields. That was David Ogilvy's kind of heuristic uh, definition of a copywriter, then still go into this business. Do you follow any podcasts? Lots, yeah. Um, Share with us your uh, podcast. Uh, well, Freakonomics has to belong there because I was listening to that yesterday, funnily enough, on education. So if you're interested in this whole problem of education, there's a whole free economic series on, uh, you know, what is the basic problem with elite higher education, that it's become a luxury good. And there's actually a book there by a guy called um, Brian Kaplan called The Case Against Education, which would be an interesting read if anybody's interested, as would, um, I think, Michael Sandel's written a piece against meritocracy, which is, which is again, interesting. Um, uh, what other podcasts? Um, general. Um, oh God, I better go. I better go up onto my pocket cast and log in, and I. Um, here we go. What what ones do I particularly? Here we go. Let's log in, and I'll do your little listeners a favour here. Dum, 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 sign in.
One thing that drives me nuts is where you have apps which don't have the web equivalent. Does that drive you crazy as well? You know, where of you course, can only and the and the app. other way around as well. The other way around, yeah, the other where, way around where, where the mobile yeah, app yeah. is just a website. Mm. <laughs> okay, Econ Talk with Russ Roberts at the Library of Economics and Liberty. That's fantastic. Uh, Hot Pipes is the cinema organ podcast. It has absolutely nothing to do with uh, behavioral science whatsoever. But if you like cinema organ recordings, that's fantastic. Um, uh, I recommend Econ Talk. I recommend um, uh, Planet Money. Very, very good NPR podcast. Uh, Tim Harford stuff is often very good. Um, so uh, if you Google... Um, uh, uh, where is the Tim Harford thing on this blasted thing? This American Life is obviously very good. To be honest, I also listen to a lot of um, true life crime. I mentioned Freakonomics, um, Cold Case Files, that's true life crime. Two things I recommend, by the way, as, an, as if, if you want to generally hone your creative instincts. And because you're in Singapore, not the United States, I can tell you this, cryptic crosswords. I really recommend, if you like it, if you hate doing them, don't. But if you enjoy them, do cryptic crosswords, because they're a lesson in seeing more than one meaning behind a sentence, okay? They're, they're, they're a lesson in seeing what everybody else sees, but reading it differently. It's what Sherlock Holmes defined as his method. I see the same things as everybody else, but I observe differently. It's a great phrase from Sherlock Holmes. The other thing I recommend is detective fiction and true life crime, because I think... Um, solving crimes and uh, uh, and general detective work has very, very strong parallels with what we need to do in uncovering what I call the real reason for things, not the official or the stated uh, or the claimed reason for things. 99% uh, Invisible, that's very good. Um, uh, the, I obviously listen to Scott Galloway because everybody does because he's very entertaining and good. Um, uh, what else? Um, uh, two, 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 two. Uh, Radio Lab, which I think is WNYC. Uh, no such thing as a fish. That's just good for trivia. Um, more or less is Tim Harford's thing behind the statistics. Um, this American Life is just interesting stuff. Stuff You Should Know. That's very good. Um, that's probably enough to be going along with, isn't it? Perfect. Perfect. That's a great list. Most of which is new to me. So that'll be it will be super worth worthwhile. Um, Rory, I want to end on a rapid fire round. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you one word, one person, and you just have to say one word that comes to your mind. Nassim Taleb. Enlightenment. Seth Godin. Uh, Original. He, uh, funnily enough, P Purple Cow was one of the great influences on my reading, uh, one of his early books. Capitalism. Adaptive. Censorship. Capitalism is a process of discovery. It's not an efficiency maximization engine. And the fact that we look at it through this Taylorist lens of delivering efficiency through competition. Uh, is a source of quite a lot of what is unnecessary pain in modern industry. It's a discovery mechanism. Censorship. Ne uh, Anti-creative. I know that's kind of two words. Boris Johnson. Flawed interesting actually i can, you, can, you can't convey them in one word Go joe on. biden i have to admit old that's one now, word i feel i feel guilty being ageist towards joe biden except for the fact that when he first ran for the senate in delaware OK, he ran a campaign which was all about his republican opposite his republican opponents old age suggesting that he was old and out of touch in a different era. So it is a bit naughty if you go back to Joe Biden's first ever senatorial campaign, I think it was, 
um, uh, what you find was him absolutely slamming his uh, opponent for their old age. So I feel justified in doing that. One last, Martin Sorrell. Bloody hell. Don't like doing this in one, you see, I don't like doing things in one word. Um, Take a sentence, I don't want to confine you. Uh, for good and ill, a force of nature. And it was extremely good in many ways, um, his force of nature behavior, but it was a bit unidirectional. I'd also say panda hugger. Uh, he was one of those people who was, for me, okay, now you might appreciate this, presumably being part of the Indian diaspora, the extent to which um, Western capitalism obsessed with China and neglected India struck me as bizarre to the point of being immoral. Given that one of them was a you know pluralistic democracy, okay, uh, the extent to which people were happy to um, uh, essentially, you know, with a sense of naive optimism that you know, okay, they probably didn't necessarily think China was going to introduce democracy, but they thought it would become a kind of Singapore, you know, if you like. Um, and the extent to which I think uh, that blinded people to possible risks, uh, uh, you know. It's one of those things which if one or two people had made that mistake, we'd be blamed, they'd be blamed for it. But when everybody makes a mistake, you're kind of safe from blame. Uh, there's a wonderful quote from, um, it's not Warren Buffett, actually, it's his uh, business partner. Uh, Charlie Munger. Who's, uh, Charlie Munger, yeah. where he said that it might, it might be Warren Buffett, actually. You know, there's no, sing there's no case of an individual lemming being singled out for a bad press which is a very good point, that if you're all running off a cliff, no one picks you out. And therefore, people who wish to avoid individual blame have a natural tendency to go along with herd behaviours, even when they're stupid. How can people follow you, Rory Sutherland? Uh, Twitter is probably the best first port of call, uh, which is at Rory Sutherland. Rory, thank you for doing this. Uh, I had a great time with you. I knew there's uh, no big deal in actually planning a structure because with you, I just wanted to go free and easy and see where the conversation goes. I'd like the way you connect idea to idea. And, you know, we just, uh, you know, went on. And on... edit any way you like. Don't worry about yeah. it. Absolutely superb. Thank you very much indeed. Absolute joy.